Hi there, and welcome to July's Jog Ramblings video. My name's Kit Brackley, and I will be looking at decolonising geography. Um, this is a huge, huge issue, uh, and I can only just scratch the surface, really, so please do think of this as like a primer or decolonisation 101. And I also need to acknowledge my own limitations of knowledge and understanding, and, you know, and there could be my inherent and un uh, subconscious biases that have gone into this. So I have had some help um, on this, and I'll give some thanks at the end. Um, and I just hope that uh, that would give this uh, a fair overview for those of you who are wondering what uh, you know all of all of the uh, the hubbub is is about when if this has been um, you've been hearing this in in the wind. So to first off, we'll give some context. And you know, many people we've we've definitely come across the name George Floyd, uh, you know, and the tragedy that 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 befell George and, um, and the Black Lives Matter uh, protest movements as well. But, uh, you know, many do believe that these are just tips of the iceberg, that these are things that, um, that we've only been seeing on the surface and, you know, the social media posts and what, what hits, the, hits our TV screens or, or social media is really only what we see at the surface and, you know, and underlying all these things. And, I, and I, I've picked out these two visualisations because I think they represent it quite well, is that there's, there's a, a, a large number of people who, who feel that, that underneath all of this, there's all these structural and institutional issues that have that have all kind of feed into what we actually only see above above the surface, so to speak. So um, to bear that in mind as well, is that there's a huge historical context. And I, I you know, I could spend whole days, not just not just minutes on, on each and every one individually and how these play into, into the issue. So um, if you feel that these are these contexts and these backgrounds are important or a specific kind of angle that you'll take on this then please do ensure that you you do your own background in, into this and i will provide some links at the end now of course the structures um that we've built and that are below the surface you know they don't appear organically um they've been constructed maintained developed molded by us using our experiences our attitudes our world views and you know many of them most of them may not have been malicious or may not be malicious by uh intent they might have just ended up being subconsciously malicious but um questions we should really ask ourselves is it why is it that we have some group of people who do not see what's below the iceberg and we have a group of people or people who do see what's and do experience what's below the iceberg so um, questions like why do we have people who are kind caring compassionate and they genuinely wholeheartedly you know to use a cliche feel they don't have a racist bone on their body but do still say things perform actions which which are racist or racist to to some people and when it comes to quality of life you know why is it we have some people who who have a certain standard living or quality of life or, or a measure of some extent or measure of privilege and cannot see or or tap into the fact that they may have a privilege that others don't so why should all these questions matter is of course a, a big one we should ask ourselves so you know th those should be things to look into at another time perhaps or or, or a focus of your own we don't really have time to go in much detail here, and it's one of the difficulties of this this kind of huge topic that we're looking at. So, to skip into straight to what do we mean by decolonization, and and really the dictionary definition term is completely inadequate, um, and is only one component of many components with, with the issue. Because the dictionary definition basically just means handing back the colonies, giving, uh, you know, giving these uh, places independence from colonial rule and from the empire days. But that's that's really um, maybe a symptom of everything that's been taking place and only one cog in the many, many uh, wheel and machines. So, so that's not really what we're looking into at the moment, uh, even though, but it is a, you know, a, a kind of important part. Um, it's more of a case of, well, I quite like what, um, what Fran Martin from the University of Exeter and Fran has um, helped me out with this talk, a few bits of this talk, so thank you very much, Fran. And one way that, um, that she puts it is, for example, here she says, for First Nations and American Indians, it's about giving back the land, for settler countries, decolonisation for white settlers may be different from what decolonisation in a UK context might mean for white people or people of colour. And so um, so really, perhaps you can't really define what is meant by decolonisation. Maybe it's it's an experience, maybe it's it's an attitude, maybe it's it's a history. So it's quite, quite complex in that respect. Um, uh, this book here, Culturally Responsible uh, Pedagogy, Fran really does... Uh, that for she co-edited is something that really um, would be worth looking into and um, I can provide the links there at, at the end. It also can mean different things to educators as well um, which is of course what the focus of what why you're here watching this. Um, 
whether it's decolonizing a curriculum or decolonizing the discipline or pedagogy or um you know it could whole wealth of ways that an educator can uh, can approach this in different subject context too so um and Fran actually did write um, a, a paper with uh, a colleague, Fatima Paravi Illich, um, from the University of Regina, uh, putting decolonization in context to primary education. So I'll put that in the further reading at the end. And that's something, especially if you're in primary education, that you, you definitely would like to have a look at. So while I was putting this together, actually, there was this article you see, it says, says here just from a few days ago uh, from The Guardian um, about uh, Northern California and their tribe regain their, hist their ancestral land after 250 years and and it's it's quite interesting that that article pops up and that news just just comes, comes up as we're all talking about this and so keeping your eye on the news and and thinking about you know in this context what decolonization means to to the, the native people in the americas is is going to be um overlapping and then somewhat different to what other people might say and different see in different parts of the world now history written by the victors who said that well it was not Winston Churchill um, although it does get quite often credited to him and actually the reason why I chose this title of this subsection is to is to point out to the fact that um, you know that history is almost written by the victors the, to the to the victors the spoils and and actually Matthew Phelan puts in his slate article he, he writes it quite well we have rewritten history to credit this saying or the saying to one of the 20th century's greatest victors um, we know that Winston Churchill was quite a controversial issue. Uh, you know, he's done many great deeds and great misdeeds, and that's something that you can look into yourself. But uh, I really want to come a, look, come a bit at this this way, as in this kind of to the victor, the spoils kind of manner. That that those with the power, the privilege, the authority, you know, it really is they who mostly determine what others see in the world, how they see the world, and you know what occurs within the world. And a classic example of this is, you know, the Mercator map. Um, very useful map, actually, you know, in the 16th century, uh, Mercator produced this map for the, for the primary purpose of navigation. You know, we need to make sure that the, the directions and the angles and, the, and everything was right because you don't want to be using a map which will send you off course. If you're going to be traveling south, southwest, you really want to know where you're going to end up on the map. So it was a very, very important thing. And of course, the, the, off, the consequence of making a map like that is that you distort the sizes and, and, well, those of us who, who know and, and like our map projections know that Greenland is vastly, you know, um, out of proportion to anything really uh, uh, in the North Arctic Circle there. Um, but it was quite, it was, you know, it was useful at its time. But the question I really want to want to get you to think is why is it the Mercator map or, you know, bits of um, types of the Mercator map? Why do we still use it in the age of GPS, in the age of gyro compasses, in the age of radar? Because, A, it puts Europe, the Northern Hemisphere, well, Europe and the UK in front and centre, and it distorts the map to make the North, the global North, where most of the Western countries are, you know, vastly, look, vastly a lot bigger than, than the rest of the world. So that's the question we really do need to ask ourselves, and is that why is it we are still using the Mercator map for, for displaying data most, most of the time? Why are we not using other maps? And why have we not moved on, so to speak? Of course, we, there are other maps, and I'll come to that in a second. And but I quite like this one here, which uh, which I was uh, which was flagged up to me. And you know, nothing best illust illustrates this than the Imperial Federation map of of 1886, and uh, a fantastic article written by uh, Tariq Gazelle called "Postcolonial Spaces and Identities," uh, which was in the Geography Magazine in summer 2012. It's a fantastic read, especially the section about this map. And uh, I won't go into any detail here, but if you if you kind of have a look at the illustrations around this map, it's 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 quite telling. Um, and of course, were they so relate, reliant on the Mercator map for for? But you know, this isn't really this isn't a navigation map. So why have they used the Mercator projection here? So it's just kind of these questions that we really do need to be asking ourselves, and, and why has that come about? And us geographers, well, not just geographers and our students, but anybody should be free to use whatever map that they feel is is worth is worthwhile that they need to use you know so if we have something regarding pacific ocean or we talk about you know the pacific ring of fire with tectonics we we are more likely to use the pacific centered map that makes sense and we should be using maps a bit like we use charts and graphs you know we the suitable data presentation to meet the data um but why do we not see more of it you know more pacific centered map why don't we see more maps which are skewed which have 
just the Arctic or the Antarctic. Why do we not see maps that looks like this one at the top right? This really quirky one. Quirky because of our perceptions where the world's just basically been turned upside down. It's a valid representation of the Earth, of a 2D representation of the Earth. Why is it we don't see any of these representations? I mean, if we were space aliens coming from space, we could come at Earth from any three-dimensional directions and we can approach it anyway looking like this. So why don't we not look at the Earth like that? And this is why a lot of us, of course, have turned to, to globes, whether it's physical or digital, because because they're much more representative. And a lot of digital visualizations now, you know, can come on a, on a global 3D kind of pattern, um, which is very, very useful. And sticking with maps now, if we think about um, this, that the teachers have observed that when it comes about learning about ethnicity and cultures of places, it, sometimes it doesn't go further than a map, you know. A place like this one of, of London and eth different ethnicities in London um, where different groups live and providing anecdotal evidence to potential push and pull fact uh, factors of migration and, uh, and a lot of those will fail to recognize the deeper structural um, and historical reasons for these patterns so so maps can only really tell a little bit of the story and usually miss miss kind of the background there now, one of the wonders of geography and one of the reasons why many of us teach it, of course, is, is the incredible diversity of people and places and processes. And as a subject, it really is a pick and mix lover's dream. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I love it, because it just covers so much. Um, so textbook pages like this, he says three textbook pages like this. I mean, look at the faces and the type of people who are represented in a geographer's view on what is the future for our planet in this context, climate change. So it's not just problematic, it's massively unrepresentative as well. Do only these views on climate change matter? You know, in most of this case, you know, Western white L men who are, are, are on the older kind of thing. Donald Trump, does his attitude matter? So other than, than some other, other people, what about the people where the climate change is going to impact the most? Um, people who are underprivileged or haven't got the ability to mitigate and adapt as much as some others. So... Don't those views matter? Aren't they geographers in a way? So we really do have to think about the, these things. And even examples in exam questions. So this is a particular question from paper two of the 2018 AQA GCSE paper. And uh, the first issue, I mean, there are a number of issues, but I won't go through all of them. But one of the issues is, is the term uh, war against terrorism. Now, firstly, that term isn't you know, it isn't a scientific, academic or an actual term. That was actually a political slogan that was first coined by, by George W. Bush since the 9-11 attacks. So, so we kind of got to be careful we're not using political slogans there. Um, also, terrorism, as, as GCC geographer teachers know, that it's not part of the syllabus. I mean, it, you might look at it as a, as a factor, but you don't really cover it in any, any depth. And, and unless you, you choose to study it as a, you choose to put it in your curriculum at Key Stage 3, a very vast majority of students won't cover it at Key Stage 3 ever. So most of their knowledge and understanding about terrorism is going to come from the media or, or family sources or community sources. And, and unfortunately, you know, there have been a few studies that have shown that, that the vast majority of representation of, of the war on terror has, has been, been kind of over, 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 attributed to to Muslims and Islam and so we're getting that kind of really distorted and unfair unfair view that's taking place. So while this display of what you could say is racial prejudice you know may not have been intentional but it does call into question the checks and balances of various educational establishments uh, including exam boards so um, that now, what are the checks and balances that they have in order to mitigate some implicit biases in this in this respect? Now, one of our bugbears as geography teachers, um, and it's the beautiful, wonderful, diverse continent of Africa. You know, it's almost universally experiences misconception and stereotypes uh, that you know that children have of the continent of Africa, and exploring this further, including reasons why these have come about you know, would take a series of videos in itself. So, uh, but one great read, which really can summarize it up for us all, is uh, this one here. So this is from the late Kenyan author and jour journalist, Binyavanga Wanyanya. And he has written this piece, this essay called How to Write About Africa. And it's fantastic. So what I'm gonna do is just pick out a few phrases. And a good thing for us educators to do 
is have a look at our syllabuses, our lessons or whatever, and think to what extent do we play into some of these stereotypes or these, or these misconceptions or these views? Or, or if we do, do we put them in context? Do we say that these are not the whole picture? But just have a think about these, some of these ones here. If you must include an African, make sure you get one in a Maasai or Zulu or dog on dress. So about appearance. So when we, maybe that first page spread of the, if you're teaching a content in Africa, do you put an image that has those things up there? Is that one of the first things that the children see when you, when you first teach about, about the continent of Africa? Treat Africa as if it was one country. It's hot and dusty with rolling grasslands and huge herds of animals and tall, thin people who are starving. So I'll, I'll leave you with that one. African characters should be colourful, exotic, larger than life, but empty inside. With no dialogue, no conflicts, resolutions in their stories, no depth or quirks to, to confuse the cause. So, you know, how much do we stereotype or bundle in kind of like big regional you know, national issues into people and we don't think, well, do they have an individual story? What do they part of? What efforts have they? So we don't usually get into that kind of individual level or, lo or even local level sometimes kind of kind of uh, context into, into issues. So I would strongly recommend that you have a read of that and, and then maybe go through the highlight and think, yeah, we kind of, we teach this, but, but how do you avoid making that a stereotype? How do you avoid that becoming a misconception of, of a, a, a massive you know, diverse continent that, that is that is Africa. <clears throat> so, and we've got to we've got to think about these things because our narrow and stereotype depictions of Africa, you know, and relying on single stories not just fuel misconception of lack of knowledge, but they can actually form a rotten core of misunderstanding and disrespect and prejudice. And um, I was given I was flagged up this uh, TED talk, which is a wonderful listen, and it's definitely worth the time of uh, Chiamanda Adichie, who recalls the time that when she was at university uh, and when she was 19, the, she had an American um, roommate and her American roommate was asking her questions. Well, she, was, she said she was shocked by Chiamanda and she was asking questions like, how do you learn English so well? Can I listen to your tribal music? You know, and her roommate was surprised she could use a stove. And, and there was one telling moment of, of the TED Talk where Chiamanda says, um, that her roommate felt sorry for her before she even got to know her. Um, you know, and I, she called it a patronising, well-meaning pity. Um, but you do need to listen to the whole TED Talk to kind of get the whole kind of background context. It's fantastic. But it does give you the kind of, you know, that, Amer that American uh, roommate was at university with her. So therefore has gone through what you would hope would be a very good you know, education system for her to get to that point or have had a good experience herself in the education system. So, so but she still has these kind of, um, these kind of prejudices that are, that are playing out here. Now, it's worth noting that, uh, going back on some about the, about the uh, you know, the different views of decolonization, things like that, is that um, Chia Amanda herself, you know, takes space as her class and ethnicity have, has uh, power within Nigerian. You know, she says that she's a middle-class Nigerian. So, so we even have to give uh, thought to to how her thoughts, experiences, you know, can play differently to someone else in Nigerian society, or even even a different aspect of Nigerian society. So so she doesn't represent the whole of the country of Nigeria, and she certainly doesn't represent the whole continent of Africa. Just going back to that link a bit earlier. Now Africa is a vast and exceptionally diverse continent, and one attempt to visualise this uh, in terms of mapping has been Harvard University's map. Uh, based on a book edited by anthropologist Mark uh, Leo Felix, and it is brilliant and it's interactive. We all like interactive maps, so effectively it's a, it's it's a GIS. So uh, do take a look at it. Here's the link just here, um, and yeah, I won't go through any examples of this, but as you can see down here with the key, you've got so many different ways of looking at, at the continent of Africa and the kind of the patchwork myriad differences and and how these differences can be very very localized and and into small regions, not just you know, on a nation by nation kind of scale. And it is really worth an explore. And if, if you want, I suppose, a good thing for, to do with your students, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do an overview of the continent of Africa, it's just say, right, the very the first lesson, the first half lesson, get them to explore that map. And then they'll, they'll just automatically get that feeling of how diverse the, the, the continent is. So, how do we decolonize geography? Well, I'm gonna, 
I'm not going to say that I'm going to cop out here because because uh, that would be unfair because because it really would deserve more attention. This so um, all I'm going to do instead is say start with reflection. So I'll just focus on reflection and maybe later on down the line um, with 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 my friends who've been helping out with this, we'll perhaps do another video about some more details about how you can decolonize geography. The decolonization geography working group, which I got a lot of help from. Um, they've put, they're putting together a document that you can have a look at and they put in a series of reflection questions that teachers and, and departments really and schools should be asking themselves. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples from here that have some really good questions that you should really just start asking yourself and then, and then you know, you may not have specific answers, but it does get you thinking the right way. So for whom do you design your curriculum? Who is your ideal imagined student and what assumptions do you make um, about their backgrounds, culture, languages and schooling? Um, you know, good teachers are meant to know their, their students, the students that they teach. And, you know, the more that you know about your catchment area and your cohorts and the culture of your school, then the more effectively you can, you can teach. So, so you hope you'd be doing that anyway. Um, so that's just an extension of that. How do you relate to the cultures, languages and lived experiences of all students? Do you draw on these valuable resources in your teaching? Um, I, I did this when I was teaching year nine uh, geography about development and we focused on Malawi as a country because it's a country I was lucky enough to visit and um, and picked up a, a tiny bit of the lingo but I'm not going to try and embarrass myself here and I was lucky enough to have a, um, a student in one of my year nine classes who was actually had a Malawian dad he was half Mal Malawian and so I asked would he would he be comfortable to come and actually teach us what Malawi is to him uh, you know, from that point of view and, and get his dad's point of view. And it was absolutely amazing. I tell you, it was the best lesson I never taught um, was letting that young lad uh, take those lessons. And, and we actually were lucky enough for him to come out of other lessons and talk to the other year nine classes as well. So, so you know, students are assets as, as well as those, you know, children there to be taught. So, um, so that's how I went about this without, you know, before I ever came to, came to this. How do you build a learning community in your classroom where students learn actively from each other and draw on their own knowledge sources? So, you know, I could give that example that I just give there, but, but that's, you know, utilising your students as a resource and, and rather than kind of feeding them information that can build misconceptions and, and kind of like be part of this structural problem, you know, is there any way we can draw on our students' experiences um, in that respect? Okay, so that's it for now. I've definitely run out of time. Um, there is so much further reading um, that you can go on this and you can go whichever which way you feel is really, really interesting or pertinent or important to you. Uh, but these are the ones that, um, that I definitely feel that you should have a look at. Um, and I've made references throughout this, this, this thing. So the book there by Fran, uh, that Fran Martin helped to edit, definitely check that one out. And the, um, the, the article that I wrote about uh, primary geography and what it means in context of primary geography so that's pretty good and that Tariq Giselle article fantastic read very lovely illustrated as well you should definitely check that out um, Rach Robinson has done a fantastic uh, blog entry over on her blog about um, what what you know what her her feelings on decolonized geography she's tried to kind of go on the next step that beyond this so how do we go about these kind of things so if you are so desperate to look at the the next steps how do you go about it then go check out Rach's blog and and she did what I did at the start of, of her blog entry too. She said, like, I, you know, this is some, this from my point of view, I, I do have my own biases. I've, I'm not knowledgeable and things like that. And the vast majority of us are in that position. So don't feel, you know, too um, put off by the fact that, that, you know, if you're all like me, a white individual with quite a high level of privilege, that you can't tackle this issue. No, we, in fact, we're the people who should be helping with this issue. So so start somewhere, you know, do little things, start somewhere, watch this video, have a look at Rachel's blog, do some of this background reading, and that's a good start in itself. Um, and Rach and I are part of this uh, decolonization, uh, decolonizing geography working group, um, and I'm learning things all the time, and um, it's an absolute pleasure to be a part of, and we're really doing interesting things, and you'll definitely be hearing some things coming coming your way, and the, the, the group of people is such a joy to work with, so you'll probably see more coming from, from them soon. So I hope you found it useful. Um, as always, there'll be an accompanying uh, blog entry with this. So if there's any details that I missed out or I tripped up on or any corrections, any advices or any mistakes that I've made that, I've, uh, that I want to correct, there'll be in that there. Um, do follow me on Twitter and Facebook and uh, do subscribe to my blog, go to jogramblings.com. So uh, take care until next time.